Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining our afternoon session. Uh, I'm Chris Woodfield with the NANOG Program Committee. Uh, before we get started our next session, uh, I want to remind you all to uh, fill out your surveys um, and also, uh, join, also join the expo. Uh, links are available on the NANOG website uh, for both of those. So uh, uh, enjoy the expo, and uh, we'd love to hear back from you. Uh, this is obviously the first time doing this, so feedback is more desire than than usual um given given that given the uh the format we're we're taking here um so uh, let me start our uh, introduce our next speaker uh matt ringle is the senior architect for network planning at akamai uh, his primary job is giving specific answers to vague capacity questions uh before that he worked for akamai's professional services group uh where he learned to tell stories with a whiteboard um, and today, Matt's going to share some of what he's learned on that subject. Um, and with that, I will introduce Matt Ringel. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So, hello. My name is Matt Ringel, as Chris said. Um, I have done a lot of work. I have done a lot of work with telling stories with things in front of me, typically involving pens and whiteboards. Um, but as we know, circumstances demand that we do not have a whiteboard. Um, also, lighting a whiteboard is hard. So instead, um, we're using a virtual whiteboard, and I get to use a graphics tablet, and we're going to do this talk on how to give a whiteboard talk, whiteboarding 101. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, so let's just get right into it. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, haha, you see, I have another one. It's great. Um, so. If we And so keep in mind, this is all live, right? I was told never to do a live demo. Well, guess what? Here we are. Um, so, hello? There we are. Hi! That's me. Um, what is a whiteboard? We're just going to say WB because we know what we're talking about. So a whiteboard is, you know, in the, in the end, if you want to get right down to it, it is just a surface you can write on, right? That you can erase on, what have you, dry erase markers, technology. The tricky part is, or the best part is, what you can do with it. Because normally when you do a presentation or PowerPoint or stuff, you're presenting and that has its place in life. But in the case of a whiteboard, you get to tell a story and you get to tell the story live while you're doing it. Because narrative, is incredibly important. Narrative is, is stories. That's how humans evolved to you know, move to the top over time. That's, that's what humans do. We tell stories to each other. We're able to relay information to each other. It's the way that I can get a thought into your head without surgery. Um, I don't think surgery would even work. But words, language, story, and with a whiteboard, Pictures, like this fluffy cloud and these two stick figures, represent how we can actually talk with each other. And so, given that, what do I also get? You know, I talk about things you get for free, things that are easier to do with a whiteboard, right? So, if you imagine, one of the things we get is um, we're talking about real time storytelling, but what does that also mean? That means real time organization of data. I can put data at a fairly low density on a whiteboard and talk about things. There are two apples, three oranges, and poof, I've got a table. Um, in addition, being able to talk about, I, I put, it, put it another way, is that, so first I can talk about stories. First this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and then a new challenger arrives, and this happens, and that happens, and then we have a story, and you can follow all the way to the end. And this is whether your audience is 10 people or 100 or 300. I've given this talk in several venues in that regard. And you end up here. But the other thing that it gives you is it gives you a way to tell data. I mean, if you think about a comic book, it's a serial novel. You're, you have these pictures, 
and one happens after the other. Taken individually, they're just pictures, but put it in order, they tell a story. And so what we're going to talk about today is how whiteboards are narrative plus visual organization and how you can use that period, ran out of space. So we can actually talk about how you can get things out to an audience, how you can express things in an audience. And this will be what you're trying to convince um, somebody to buy your thing, um, whether it's convincing people to take a certain technical tack on things, whether it's convincing people not to do a thing or anything in between. But it's about being able to display your thought in a way that is easy to get in their head. And one of those thoughts will be how to give a whiteboard presentation. So, without further ado, let's just start right in. So the first thing is, when you're talking about a story, the first thing we're going to talk about is boundaries. And by boundaries, I mean, what are the things you want to talk about? What are the, what are the stories you want to tell? What is the story you want to tell? Remember, you've got a whole bunch of people in the room with a whole bunch of thoughts in their head, and it's just you up there armed with a miraculous device called a whiteboard, but that's all you've got. So let's do a little bit of planning first, shall we? So the first thing we're going to think of is, um, so we think of the horizontal boundaries, okay? So I've got this boundary and this boundary, and let's say here is all the thoughts we could possibly have on things. Um, so between these two boundaries, I just had arrows, there's lines, and now you have a space between two things. You filled that all in yourself. We'll get to that later. Um, between these two things represents the, or I should say, sorry. Also, the nice thing about a whiteboard is you can erase. Not like that. So, there's new technology for all of us. So, in fact, what we can do is we can say your horizontal boundaries there are your story or your scope. This represent the topic you're going to talk about. Are you talking about um, bird watching? Are you talking about the binoculars you use for bird watching? The cameras you use for bird watching? Are you talking about networks as a whole? Are you talking about network equipment? Are you talking about one specific vendor? Are you talking about a bake-off between them? Are you talking about wide area networking? What is the topic and how much of it do you want to cover? Obviously, the less time you have, the less you get to cover, and you've got to choose the level at which you want to do it. So now you've got your subject matter locked down. You kind of know what you want to talk about. The other thing you have is your vertical boundaries. See, this is totally vertical. Um, and that represents abstraction. Now, abstraction in this case means how deep into the weeds do you want to get? In specific, um, are we talking about something, are we giving a survey of a topic? You know, there's no bad or good answer here. Are you giving a survey of a topic where you're just kind of, okay, well, here's a bunch of different ways. We're not going to touch on details for any of them, but here's the range of what's around. You know, that might be a high level abstraction. Or this is the, well, these are the bits you actually have to twiddle in order to make sure that it, you don't have this race condition in this case with this packet at this time in order to make sure that this interface doesn't burst into flames. Um, and it's these specific bits and have a nice day. Let me show you the hex editor. That would be a pretty low level of abstraction. Okay, fine. Now, the interesting things about this are, so once again, horizontal scope, vertical is abstraction. You have to be very careful about abstraction. You can pretty much decide on the topic you're going to talk about and keep talking about that. But the hard part here is, if you imagine, we're going to uh, put a little, little Cartesian action up here. And so we're going to have, you know, time goes this way and abstraction goes this way. Now, what I say about vertical boundaries, right? So let's say you've chosen that your abstraction is, your level of abstraction is going to be around here. Great. So let's put, you know, a couple of control boundaries around that. This is hardly quantitative, but you'll see what I'm getting at. Okay. So ideally, 
you do not want your talk to deviate from this level of abstraction. You never want to get, because what happens is if you break out too high, it ends up being very, very fluffy or hand wavy. And that's a problem because now people are like, why, why did I waste my time? Why am I here? What did I do? Why, why did I even come here? I'm not learning anything. I've got better things to do with my time. Um, similarly, if you break out too low, you end up in the weeds. Or rat holing, or choose whatever phrase you like to use for it, right? Um, specifically, if I go too far into the details, it's not that it's not interesting. Number one, it might be interesting to you, but that's not the interesting part. You're supposed to be interesting for other people here. You're the one telling the story. But also, um, you've shrunken down your audience. It is entirely possible, even likely, that you have now um, only got the attention of one person in a room of 10 or 100 or 300 with your one detail. Um, if they need to ask questions that are relevant, telling them, hey, you know, that's a great question. It's a little bit outside the scope of this discussion. I'll be glad to talk with you about it out offline. And similarly, if someone wants to ask a very, very high-level question um, or is asking kind of a 101 question about something where you're giving a much more advanced talk, you say, I see where you're coming from. Um, I'd like to hold off the overview until later. Um, talk to me afterwards. And that's okay. You are there to be available to tell people, but the people in the room are, you need to, are the ones you need to accommodate to. The nice thing about boundaries is that this becomes a really interesting self-check. Um, because you can actually, you know, while you're talking, because hopefully you've got a little bit of uh, CPU that you can actually think about what you're saying while you're saying it, and say, am I going too high up? Am I going too high up in this talk? Am I too abstracted? Am I not? Am I, am I, am I hand-waving a bit more? Am I going up to a survey level? Am I too basic for the people who are in here? Um, or alternately, have I gone way far down because I find the technical details awesome and engrossing, but they're really not relevant to the subject at hand? Either case, the solution is finish your thought, because stopping in the middle of the sentence gets everybody weird. Um, finish your thought, and then say, now, that's interesting. Or, you know, that was, I'm sure that was, there was useful details for some people, but let's bring it back. And you could even just say, let's bring it back, because then people will know that you're actively interested in bringing it back to something that is useful to them. So, in short, boundaries are important because that's how your talk stays relevant to the people in the room at a time, and they know they've shown up for the things they want to show up for. Now, If instead, we want to talk about, um, the, the next thing after talking about boundaries, we want to talk about framing. Okay. What does framing mean in this case? So put one way, I could say it's the context of your talk. It's the context you are giving for your talk. The reason you're there at all. Um, Another way to put it, if you like a sports metaphor, is it's the field you're playing on. You decide, I'm going to play football on this football field, or I'm going to play cricket on this cricket field, or I'm going to play something else on a something else field, but this is the field I'm playing on, and fields have properties, and you have, to, you have to decide that this is the context in which I'm going to be doing this thing, whatever I'm doing. Now, what does this mean in this case? Well, think of it this way. Part of it is... Describing, um, so part of it is, what is the problem? What is the solution? Why are you there talking to people? And so one of the things you can do, because once again, you need to build the boundaries in real time. Everyone else walking into that room, they might know what the subject is, but they don't know anything else. And so you can do stuff like, um, assert the problem. and offer a solution. Now, I realize that sounds pretty salesy, but uh, bear with me for a second here. So, asserting the problem. You know, a, a way to think of this is, 
I know that you all have a problem. And in fact, I know what that problem is. And I'm going to tell you what that problem is, even though we all know what the problem is, just so that we can all acknowledge that we're on the same page. And so you start talking about, okay, as far as I know, the primary issue here is you have poor web performance on the site, you've eliminated all the other factors, and you're reasonably sure that it has to do with the way that your origin is behaving. Okay, so let's talk about web performance there, because without saying that, and just saying, okay, so let's talk about your origin. People are like, what? Why? I didn't know we had a problem with that. That was an issue, and people start talking about William Shatner. It's very weird. But the point is that instead, you are saying, I know why I am here. And that sounds silly, but it's true, right? And this could be for, okay, you've got a meeting of five people inside your company, and you're doing a presentation, and it's the, here's the reason we're here. Here's the reason we're talking. Here's the reason I'm in front of you drawing on this whiteboard. Um, and that gets everybody on the same page. And the other thing that does is it focuses the debate. It says, not only do I know what the problem is, but I know what we're going to talk about and the level of abstraction and the scope of what we're going to talk about. Remember from before, scope and abstraction. Also, offer the solution. You know, you know, people talk, I don't want problems, I want solutions. And sometimes solutions are hard, but being able to say, here is a problem, and even if we don't have a solution, we are going to discuss about it because it's something that needs solved. Well, then your solution is that you're discussing something that need, you need discussing it in order to get to one. But if there is a specific solution, then you're able to actually talk about it and couch the problem in the terms of the solution, because this is your presentation where you're trying to convince somebody saying, I believe this is the problem. I believe I found a solution. Here's how I get there. And the interesting part there is that it also gives you a safety because what happens when you have the wrong problem? Somebody in the room can correct you. And therefore, without getting into the weeds of the problem, you can say, okay, let's discuss the scope of the problem. And now, once again, everybody's on the same page as opposed to one person tuning out and wasting everybody's time in the process. The other thing by offering the solution is that you get to guide the debate. First, here's what we're going to focus is what we're going to talk about. Guide is how we're going to talk about it. And in the end, people are there to listen to you. You are expected to be the expert in the room, and people generally want to hear from you, else they wouldn't be putting else you wouldn't be up there in the front anyway. And that goes for any kind of talk like this. Um, the other thing that's interesting, I say interesting a lot, I'm really sorry about that, but it's true. Um, is talking about is talking about diagrams. So pictures, right? The nifty thing about being able to deal with a whiteboard is that you can think in terms of pictures. So here's here's a fun trick. So I'm going to draw, uh, you know, draw a a you know. I, I'm sure people have seen the Gartner Magic Quadrant. There's four boxes, or anybody who's like gone anywhere within like 20 feet of a business or within like, you know, 20 miles of business school has seen like, okay, there's four boxes and everything fits in these side of those four boxes. Well, there's something that's really interesting about four boxes. Because um, as soon as you put that up on the screen and other people have seen that too, you are getting them to buy into a whole bunch of different assumptions about the world. Okay, let's count them off. So, now, obviously, you know, we're starting at the bottom, bottom left here. So we got that, we got that, right? And so first thing is, there are two axes. And more importantly, those axes are relevant and distinct. Not only do we care about them, but we know that they're sufficiently different from each other that we can put them on two separate axes. Great. Two, um, there are two settings on each axis that are relevant and distinct, right? You've got low and you've got high. You've got low and you've got high. So uh, low, high, low, high. I mean, this could be minus, plus, and 
you know, minus plus if you want. It could be, you know, whatever you want. But in the end, there's only two settings on each axis, and there you go. Um, three. Um, there are only four permutations that matter. Permutations. Only four permutations that are actually relevant and distinct. Um, maybe this is a good one, and maybe that's a bad one, and maybe that's a good one, and maybe that's an awesome one. I don't know. But in the end, you have four different things. These are the only four things worth talking about. And they are all sufficiently distinct from each other, and they are all of equal relevance that they're worth talking about. Right? Equal relevance. So just by drawing these four boxes, I have you have successfully dragged the audience along on a whole bunch of other assumptions about the way that you should see the world. You have both focused the discussion such that this is the only world that exists. And you have guided the discussion by saying that only those four things are worth talking about. Once again, framing allows you to focus and guide. So let's take a couple of other examples of these, and then we'll move on. Right? So, uh, yeah, you too. So, if you think about it, another, let's take a, another, let's run through a couple of more examples, right? Um, a number line. Okay, zero to, uh, I don't know, 10 sounds good. And a five in the middle, because I feel like it. Well, what happens at this point? Now I've told you there's only one axis, right? So one axis. Um, things are linear among it. Um, linear distribution. I've told you what the range, I've told you the range, I've told you the extremes of the range. So how we're going to think of this between zero and 10. And I've told you there's a middle. There is a point exactly between these two. And people will, people will say, looking at this, like, okay, so clearly there's a thing that could go from A to B and A and a half is a viable setting as well. And now we can talk about that. Okay, great. Let's take another one. This is the power of pictures. So um, here's one everybody's seen. That's a bell curve. Just work with me here, right? So it's a bell curve, right? It's a normal distribution. We know that there are, what do we know about normal distributions? There are standard deviations. There's we know that you know 66% something like that is within here and we know that you know 95 plus percent or whatever is in these and then lots of stuff is out here but there is a middle most of the things that we're looking at end up in the middle and there's an even distribution to both sides these are all traits of a normal distribution if you draw a bell curve on the board and this is the important part, whether you mean to or not, you have told people to assume everything about a normal distribution, which means choose your pictures carefully. Because if you draw a normal distribution on the board, if you draw a bell curve on the board, and then suddenly what you're talking about has nothing to do with it, they're like, then why did you draw that picture? And now you've lost your audience. So um, let's take another couple of examples. Um, so before we, before we finish up here, um, another couple of ways to think about framing is what is, um, you know, how do you, how do you give focus when you're actually talking, right? I can say, um, enterprises are moving to the cloud. What does that mean? 
Well, there's now a discussion about cloud migration. You've even talked about the businesses that are going to get moving there. And so people now chunk through their heads and they go, okay, we're talking about enterprises, we're talking about cloud migration, we're talking about migration between something and going somewhere. We're doing, you've now set up a cascade of assumptions about what they're going to think about next. Alternately, um, there are four basic types of, of bots, like, you know, scrapers. Or bots, right? So what have I said at that point? Well, I've told you that, you know, this behavior, so what can happen at that point? Number one, the behavior can be organized. We know that there are, we can take the noun, bots, and we can assign them adjectives, types, and that those cluster into four basic types of bots, types one, two, three, and four. And anything that we talk about with bots or scrapers can be classified into those categories. People have now set up four buckets in their heads to talk about bots, and they're going to busy start sorting them. And unless you get it completely wrong, that's how they're going to walk out of the room thinking about it. And that's the power of being able to put thoughts into people's heads. So now let's move on to... Let's move on to, um, you know, I'm going to switch it up. Black is boring. Let's try this one instead. That's a nice blue. Um, depth. Okay, it's even blue for like water and depth and stuff. I like that. Um, the, what we're going to do for depth is uh, just a note on it, really. Um, one phrase, so I was in professional services at Akamai, and I taught a lot of people about a lot of things. And one of the things that they had you do was when you were when you were training up to be a professional service person before they would put you in front of a customer, is they do the whiteboard exams, where you walked into a room with a blank whiteboard, you were told what you're going to talk about, and you were going to tell and you were going to tell what your audience, uh, who your audience was, and you were just going to do it. And part of this was to teach people a couple of lessons in humility, sure, but mostly it was about do you know how to talk, you know, understanding yourself better, knowing how to, knowing how to and how not to talk about subjects and knowing how you need to be prepared. Um, one phrase that I ended up talking, using a lot was, no 10 to teach three. Which is to say, you have to have, it's obviously not mathematical, but you need a significant you need significantly more depth of knowledge than you than you than you would need um, in order to have the reserves to teach much less because while you know what you're going to teach you don't know what questions people are going to ask and you don't know how far you're going to have to reach into this 10 to pull out the 3 that you need to pull out in order to show that a you have the credibility and B, that you can coherently talk about the things that they need to link together in their head. Because every human's different, and they're not going to link things together in the same way that you do. Um, in addition, um, and I cannot say this enough, it's really, really important. Um, build a library of metaphors. Build a library of metaphors. Think about how you want to talk about your subject. Think about what metaphors you're going to use. You know, the more ways that you can describe a topic, the more audiences you're going to be able to reach. And you don't know how many audiences you have. You can have six people and three different audiences in a room. They're all listening for different things, that all learn different ways, that all need to figure out what's going on. And so, yeah, I mean, you have, you know, so, you know, I mean, you think about it in terms of, you know, there are sports metaphors, which, you know, reach, reach a bunch of people, but turn a whole bunch of people off. There's, you know, media metaphors, which, you know, when you start doing movie references and stuff, but then you're talking to a very, very specific culture, a very, very specific age slice, and that gets weird. You can talk about, you know, mechanical metaphors, which are a little bit easier in some ways because everybody's interacted with 
things that are simple and mechanical in the industrialized world. Um, obviously, there are other stuff like religious metaphors. Don't do that. You don't know who you're talking to. Um, even if you do think you know who you're talking to, you don't know who you're talking to. Um, so there's, you know, spores, you know, I mean, take your pick. But the more ways that you can describe something, um, the more chances you're going to have to be able to describe to someone better. And I would say one of the things that I got the most out of professional services in my time there was collecting metaphors for things. How do I want to talk about a web request? I can talk about it as a conversation. I can talk about it as somebody throwing a ball. I can talk about it as the requests they are. You know, I can talk about it in any number of ways. Um, so, but build the library and then choose deliberately. Um, so let me give you a specific example. And not even just like the no-nos to stay away from because we all know religious metaphors are a bad idea. Um, so actually, this is going to actually require a little bit of color. So we're going to do a little bit of color, right? So let's say... Um, that I am decide to use colors to talk about a thing. Let's say I'm using, uh, we'll, we'll call that red, just, just work with me here, um, and black. Okay, great. So we now have red and black. Um, if I'm in a financial context, actually, If I'm in a financial context, haha. They talk about choosing your symbols, right? And I've even got a little table. So, in a financial context, um, this is going to mean negative, and this is going to mean positive. I mean, yeah, you can also have parentheses, but in general, things that are in the red or in the black. But let's say I'm talking in an electrical context. What happens at that point? Well, then red is positive, and black is negative. So, once again, you, so for example, using color is a fine, fine thing to do. In fact, typically when I'm actually using an actual whiteboard, I have typically black, and, black red, and two other colors. Typically, black, red, green, blue, um, with me, just so I can, just so I can show people things. Um, a little note about human perception. Um, humans are particularly sensitive in the, you know, with red and green, and they're not really all that sensitive to blue. All blues kind of begin to look alike a little bit. Um, and they're also a little bit harder to focus on. So on a whiteboard, it's crisp, it, it's crisp, it's okay. But in general, um, using greens and reds are going to, are going to help you a bit more. Fields of blue are a little bit hard to focus on. They're easier on the eyes. Also, keep in mind, if you're talking about colorblind, colorblindness, um, red green color blindness is a thing. So make sure that you're using things that you know are distinct or call them out some other way. And that you say that, well, you know, okay, I could, because then you can just put words over it and say, you know, red and black, right? I can do that, annotate that, and people will still know what I'm talking about. But that's an accessibility thing, and accessibility matters. So um, one exercise I'm going to give you, I never promised there wouldn't be any homework, but it's not like you're reporting back to me. Um, is um, if we take, since we're all networkers here, right? If we take the TCP three-way handshake. So here's the exercise I'd like, I'd like you all to do in your spare time, because I think you'd find it interesting. Um, okay, we can talk about Axinac Ack all day long. But, or, you know, since, since, since the ACK. But the important thing here is to say, how would I describe it to someone who couldn't just pack it into the flags and the packets? How would I describe it if I had two minutes to describe it? How would I describe it? If I had one minute to describe it, how would I describe it? If I had 30 seconds to describe it, if I had one sentence, Or, alternately over here, I had 15 minutes to describe that. 
every single one of those changes the way that you take a look at what you're talking about. Every one of them, 15 minutes about the three-way handshake, you're going to talk about where it came from, why it exists in the first place, why you need it, the problems it solves. Maybe you end up going into the other parts of the state machine while you're there. Who knows? Two minutes, you're just talking about what it is. One sentence, you're saying, this is how two hosts use TCP to talk to, to initiate a connection with TCP and talk with each other. Right? There's all sorts of things in there, but if you want to build a library of metaphors, this is a really quick way to do it. It's actually kind of nice that way. And it also gives you a bunch of depth on how do I talk about the three-way handshake for 15 minutes without talking really slow? So given that, um, so let's see, we got 15 minutes left, huh? Okay, here we go. Whoa, don't do that. Okay, turbo round. So, um, a note on a, so normally this talk fits in, in uh, 90 minutes. I don't get that, so we're gonna have a little bit of fun. Here we go. Agendas. So an agenda, first we talk about X, then we talk about Y, then we talk about unicorns, then we talk about mangoes, and then there's Q&A about the mangoes and the unicorns. So, we have all that, great, got an agenda. So the first thing about an agenda, have one. The easiest way to make sure that you stay focused is to have an agenda. Especially, you know, I know people who will reject meeting invites if there's no agenda in the meeting invite because then they don't know why they're there or why they're spending their time. Likewise, for a talk, having an agenda means that you are saying, I have things I want to talk about. I am not going to waste your time, hopefully. Second thing, drive the agenda. Um, your goal, now, while there are no bonus points for getting through your entire agenda, if there's things that people want to talk about, anybody who's been in an executive meeting knows that if the executive decides to fo focus, hyper-focus on the one thing, you let them do that. But in general, um, you have a set of things you want to get through. And there was probably a reason you wanted to get through them. So try, so make sure that you're leaving enough time. Have a watch. Put a watch somewhere. Everybody's got a phone now. Um, you know, be able to have that somewhere, be able to display it, and keep track of your time and time management. Eventually, you know, you do it enough, it will it will come as a little bit of second nature. But realizing, no, 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 this agenda is here because I wanted to get through a bunch of it because I didn't want more meetings on this, because meetings take time, is important. And so the question, so have an agenda is obvious, driving the agenda, but how do you do it? Blame the agenda. Now, what do I mean by blame the agenda? I mean that the agenda is the best excuse to tell people to stop talking so you can keep going. You can say, you, if people decide to go too far into details on something and someone's going far into the weeds, too far into the weeds, say, hey, you know, thank you. That was really important. I appreciate what you're saying. We have a lot to get through today. I'm going to ask you to hold questions to the end or take them offline because there's a lot of material to cover. How many times have you all heard that? Um, just nod. I'll, I can feel it that you're nodding. That's fine. The, so in the end, agendas are incredibly important because you have to, because that is the way that you're able to move your, move your stuff forward. Okay? They're magical. Next, you too. Um, so a couple of things about audience. And, uh, so oh yeah, one other thing, a note about parking lots. So I know that some people are like, hey, you know, that's a great question. We'll talk about parking lots later. Well, well, well I'll parking lot that for now. So here's the thing. Parking lots represent a debt. Lots. Debt. Now, there might be a good reason to have a parking lot, okay? Here's things that I have to study, or here's things that I have to talk with people about, or here's to-do items that I can keep during my talk, and I kind of shove them off to the side. But every single one of those things that is a follow-up, or that is something that you're going to need to study later, what have you, is hours of your time either waiting 
or researching or what have you. And those cost time and money. So it's not wrong to have a parking lot. But keep in mind that everything that is in this parking lot represents time spent on that time that could be spent on other things, and it should be worth it to do. So let's talk a little bit about audience interaction. Now, in this particular case, um, the way that you know I'm going to interact with you is through Q and A, um, and that's going to come in about ten minutes or so, and that's fine. We'll do that. But let's say you're live in an office, um, or you are on a video conference where you can like, or where you can like kind of set up the Brady Bunch view and have everybody looking at each other, and you can actually like get nods and smiles and see what's going on. So, in a lot of those cases, so in an audience, the the idea is that you can choose three proxies. You have, you know, there's a bunch of people sitting here. And let's say, and so choose three people in the room, and you're just going to flick back and forth between them. And if this person's ha if this person's annoyed, that section is annoyed. If that person is happy, that all is happy. If that person is, I don't know, asleep or something, then you know, dreaming. Then okay, that they they've lost attention. And just flick back and forth between them because you're not going to be able to read every person in the room. Now, if you're on a video conference call, obviously that's just a little bit trickier. But fun, fa fun fact, um, people are typically, if their camera is mounted on top of their monitor, they're not looking at their camera. Um, maybe it's tilt to right. Maybe they're looking at you, but they might be looking, they'll be looking a little bit lower. If I look at the camera, I look like I'm looking through your soul. And that gets a little unnerving, especially when I can do stuff like that. So... Um, in the end, check where people are looking. It's really not hard to tell when people are on their phones, I promise. Um, they're typically looking down, their face dips a little bit out of the... You know, everybody knows, I can feel you nodding again, I promise. Um, similarly, are they looking away? Are they reading something else? Are they, do they have you on mute and are talking to other people necessarily or not? Right? You can see how engaged people are just by flicking back and forth through people to see what's going on. In that case, choosing three proxies is just as easy is just as easy to do. So, um, also, it means that um, in situations where you are more real time, you can do things like use the uh, you know a video conferencing software. Has, a bunch of video conference software has re raise your hand, raise your virtual hand, and so you can do stuff like, okay, raise your hand if you know if if you know what X is. And then you get half the people in the room raising their hand, and you say, okay, half of you know about X. Now, that isn't a conversation, right? That isn't a conversation at all. You're just pulling the audience. So what, what, what is the purpose of that? Number one, you get a little bit more knowledge about what they know, number one. Number two, they get to learn a little bit more about themselves. Okay, only hey, only half the people in the room know them, knew about that, or I didn't know about that? How weird. And number three, it's a way to reach out to them and actually talk with them. Because nothing, nothing is more deadly to focus than a PowerPoint slide that's on a screen. What? Okay, pretend that's a screen. On a screen with a disembodied voice coming out of somewhere, right? Okay, I'm looking at static text on a screen. This voice is going blah, 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 blah. And I have nothing to focus on. I've already read the slide. I have to wait for them to be done. What can I do? Now, there are some times where you don't get picture in picture, right? You have to be a disembodied voice. And let's say you're happen to use, you know, slides. Well, once again, pull the, you know, if you can pull the audience, great. If you can, if it's a small group where you can take questions, great. If there's any way that you can be more interactive so that you can actually get people to be engaged because they feel there and you're not just talking in their general direction, fabulous. So, um, oh, six minutes, here we go. So, um, very quickly, we're going to go through pitfalls. Okay? First, what do geeks tend to do? 
know, what, what, what do technically oriented people tend to do when, when they're talking? So, um, knowledging. Hey, I'm just going to dump all the knowledge I have on this topic at you in no particular order, and you're going to say that I'm really smart. Well, one problem. Everyone else has done that too, and they know that you're doing that because you've ran out of ideas on how to present it. Presenting is a skill. Respect your people's time. Two, um, taking things personally. If a person asks you a question, it's not because they are challenging you. It is because they're actually asking a question. Or it is good to assume that the first thing they're doing is asking you a question because they want to know the answer and not because they're trying to find you out as a fraud. Um, but the biggest one, um, and we're going to talk about this because really if this is the one thing you take away from this, I'm happy. Making stuff up. Being so... Being it, having it be so important that you know what you're talking about that you start filling in knowledge with intuition on the fly without actually knowing. So let me talk about the mechanics of that because this is actually really important. Okay? So you're standing up here. You're at a whiteboard, right? And you've got three people here in the audience. Okay? So you're doing your spiel, doing your thing. First person ask a question. Question number one. Now, you are 100% sure of that answer. You, don't, you just worked on it the other day. You might have read it beforehand. And so you answer them. And you got it right because you were 100%, you were 100 confident. Good for you. Gold star. Next person asks a question. Two. Now, let's say you're 95% correct. Maybe you worked on that last week. You really remember it. You remember typing it in, but memories are weird. And, but, you know, you're 95% sure. Well, you're never going to be 100% sure of everything, and 1 to 20 is good odds. So, okay, 1 to 20 is good odds. So, okay, you answer that too. And you got it right. Okay. But now the third person asks a question. Now you're only 75% sure. Well, here's the problem. You're the question answerer now, and you want to keep answering questions. And you want to convince yourself, that, hey, I have right answers. I'm clearly the expert. They think it's the expert. I'm feeling pretty good. Of course I'm going to answer them. And let's say that's wrong. Well, here's the problem. They're not going to know it's wrong until they talk to one of their colleagues. And they say, hey. And they're like, dude, that's wrong. Like, what? And in the end, now your credibility is shot. Their credibility is shot. Um. And, and it was all because you needed to feel like you were the expert. And that's just bad. Do not make stuff up. Saying I don't know is always better in the long run. No, really, we checked. So. To wrap this all up. Um, actually, I'm going to tell you about one more thing. Um, because So, okay. One and a half minutes, great. Here we go. Problem audiences, okay. And if we go, if we get, um, so we have. So first, we have the sniper, the person who will kind of make side comments to other people in the room, but doesn't actually talk with you, and doesn't actually interact. They want all the they want all the pride of knowledge without the responsibility of actually being able to interact. How do you deal with them? Drag them in. I'm sorry, do you have something to say with the class? Great, let's talk about that. Um, next, the bully. They had a mimetic immune response. They cannot believe what you're saying. That has to be horrible. That, ca that can't possibly be true. You're utterly wrong. In general, the answer is wait for them to be done. Do not address them. Just wait them out because all their coworkers are looking at them like they're a crazy person. And, or at the very least, someone who hasn't really thought through their opinions through more appropriately. And they're wondering, waiting for them to wait them out, too. There's no reason to engage. Um, but the biggest one, this is what I'm going to leave you with, is the NACMOC. Now, what is NACMOC? NACMOC stands for not a question. More of a comment. 
you have seen these people. They get up to the mic. And they're like, well, you know, when I blah, 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 blah. And also I blah, 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 blah. And similarly, blah, blah, blah. Would the audience agree or would the panelist agree that blah, 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 blah. And they didn't actually want to ask a question. They just wanted to show everybody how smart they are. If someone says there's not a question, you said, well, this is for Q&A. Um, I'd be glad to talk with you afterwards and just shut them down. Cut their mic if you need to. It's that important because they are wasting everybody else's time for their satisfaction. And that's a problem. Don't, <laughs> don't entertain the knock mock. So there's a lot else to talk about. Um, but in the end, we are now at Q&A. And I hope this was useful to you. There's a lot to talk about, right? There's boundaries, framing, controlling the conversation, focusing the debates, you know, fo focusing the debate, guiding the debate, how to handle problem audiences, how to use diagrams to have things that people already buy into. We've covered a lot of stuff here. I hope this really helps you with your whiteboard. I, I hope this really helps you with any kind of presentation you do, especially with how you do a whiteboard. So thank you very much. And uh, Chris, the questions? I cannot hear you. You're right. I was muted. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now you can hear me. So thank, uh, thanks, Matt, for that presentation. Uh, we do have some questions in the queue. Um, okay. The first question, uh, now that you've done this live, uh, how does this compare to using a real physical whiteboard? Any advice or comments on the technology that you're using? Sure. So number one, my handwriting is so much nicer live. Um, Getting used, to, I mean, even using a high resolution graphics tablet, um, it's just, it's a different skill. Much like writing on paper, which is a horizontal plane, and writing on a whiteboard, which is a vertical plane, are two separate skills. Writing on some place where you do not get the feedback of the written word in front of you, um, where you're writing in one place and seeing it someplace else, is another skill. And that's, impor and that's important. What I'd say here is, Get the graphics tablet in a couple of extra weeks before you do this thing. Um, but in reality, I like being able to, you know, you get used to it. I'm, I'm able to select, you know, I'm able to select, I'm able to erase, I'm able to do things. And this is just scratching the surface of what most whiteboard stuff uses. It's, it's interesting to me. I wanted to use more capabilities of it, but I just didn't have the time. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, can you talk about the tool that you're using right now? Chris, am I allowed to talk about the tool I'm using right now? Yes. Yes, okay. you are allowed to talk about the tool that you're using. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So just so everybody knows, Nanog has, you know, things about talking about vendors, but in this case, since it's independent of that and just it's the thing. Um, Chris, that, that sounds about right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So yeah. um, the tool here I'm using is called Miro. You can see the kind of logo up in the top left corner. It really is... I did a web search for whiteboarding software. It came up with top 10 whiteboarding softwares, and I chose one that looked good, and this one appears to have worked pretty well. Um, I'm still getting used to it. I've only been playing with it for you know, a few days now, um, but, I, but it does what I need it to, and it certainly I know I'm only scratching the surface of the feature set by just using it as a plain thing to write a whiteboard on. So you know, without endorsing it, I'd say that, you know, well, you've seen about how the basic functionality works in practice, and I'll leave it there. Thanks. Um, next question. Um, what do you think about standalone graphics programs versus, versus uh, whiteboards integrated with video conference? Um, you know, if you're running a, I'm assuming you mean if you're running a regular program, uh, like a separate program versus something that's in, in the web. Um, what is your opinion on, uh, what's your, you know, you mentioned uh, best in classroom programs, which was addressed before. Um, do you have any opinions on hardware selection? Um, so, um, I'll I'm going to get. So, I'm going to go back to the previous question and say, by the way, just so, in in terms of the actual hardware I'm using for graphics, I'm using a Wacom um, Wacom Intuos Intuos M Pro graphics tablet, um, which, as of the time of this recording, is a few hundred dollars. Um, but um, the and I, I really enjoy it. It works. I've got really, really neat handwriting. And unfortunately, while it isn't reflected here, it is, it's something where I could really see doing a lot of work, especially for artistic work, too. So I'm happy with it. Um, in terms of using you know, native video conference whiteboard chat, 
I have found that, you know, using a graph, you know, trying to like write with a mouse is just hard. Um, also, most of the, I, I mean, if I have to use, you know, the video conferences built in stuff because that's what's easy to integrate, then I'll use it. I just find that I'm much more comfortable with dedicated whiteboard software personally myself because it's just, it flows better and it's actually meant for drawing as opposed to sketching stuff out. I actually missed a little bit of that question. Uh, you know, what, what, what did you consider in making your selections? Oh, for, um, so, for in, so, so, so in the case of apps, it was really just a, let me look through them and see what someone else said about the pros and cons, and then I'll choose one, and I'll, I'll choose a couple and see how they go. It was really, okay. um, I do like the fact that I have a big workspace. If you take a look at the bottom right of my screen, you'll see I actually have a very large workspace I can move around. There's a whole bunch of stuff we didn't even go through yet. Um, there's... Oh, that's right. You can't see it because I stopped sharing the screen. But there's basically this is just one thing of a gigantic workspace, um, which is awfully nice. Um, also, the ability to share the whiteboard with others because part of what I like is the idea of being able to um, collaborate with people. So everybody's working on the same whiteboard at the same time to do a thing. And especially if we're all stuck at home, then this is a way to get people to collaborate in a graphical medium as opposed to trying to say things with words that may not actually match up with what they want. And trying to do things in a graphic, trying to do things in like a Visio style program on the fly can get pretty bulky, um, can, can, get, can, can get kind of kind of unwieldy because it was never meant for that kind of live drawing exercise. So, you know, and, and as for the tablet, mostly it's the, okay, well, what's a pro tablet that's not gonna break the bank and that's gonna last a while. And that's where I came up and I had a budget and I chose something. You can, um, there are websites that'll show you there's you know tab there you can get a decent tablet for just shy of a hundred dollars a uh, hundred usd as well um i just want something high scale because like i'm just going to keep it on for a while okay. all right um i think that concludes the questions uh all right thank you very much for your presentation matt um thank you, reminder Chris. to Welcome. Uh, reminder: uh, the uh, the expo is going on right now. If you'd like to join that, uh, the link is uh, on the NAMAP website. And uh, do not forget to fill in the surveys. Um, I believe I believe we're getting participants are getting emails uh, with links to surveys. So if you get those emails, use that. Otherwise, you can do it from the website. Um, thank you very much, and uh, we'll move along to our next session in just a few minutes. Right. Take care. Thank you.